Good morning. morning. It is uh, wonderful to see you on uh, this Lord's Day. If you uh, if you have a bulletin, go ahead and take it out, and I want (coughs) to excuse me point out a few things to you uh, in our bulletin and a few announcements for you today. Uh, A few announcements for you are. um, as follows, I, I have these uh, brochures up here for our Israel trip. If you're interested in going to, uh, to Israel, there's still time to, uh, to decide. But if you, if you want one of these bulletins here, uh, brochures, please come up after the service and get one. Uh, they're just right here in the, the pulpit. If, you, if I'm tied up, you can just grab one. <clears throat> but it's a 10-day trip. It's next March. Uh, the deadline is uh, months away, so you've got plenty of time to grab a brochure and consider whether or not you uh, want to make this trip. Um, this is a wonderful trip. Uh, we did it uh, right before COVID. In fact, I think we brought COVID from Israel to America, so y'all are welcome. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, but at any rate, we're going to go back uh, next year. And so if you want one of those, uh, those brochures... Uh, to consider that trip, please please do that. Also, uh, these prayer guides, I still have plenty of these prayer guides uh, for Catalyst Missions. Uh, this helps you know how to pray for Catalyst Missions. Uh, we're in four different countries in West Africa, uh, nine different training sites, and over 300 indigenous pastors are being trained on a monthly basis uh, because of our partnership with Catalyst Missions. And so uh, come get one of those also. If you don't have one, uh, please, please grab one. Also, uh, we're beginning a new month tomorrow, August the 1st. And uh, so we're still, we still have our reading list. I know some of you got this reading list at the beginning of the year. Uh, I haven't done a very good job of, of telling you what book is next, and so I'm sorry for that. But uh, this coming month, the month of August, is a, a wonderful book, and I highly recommend this book. And uh, the name of the book is When Being Good Isn't Good Enough. And it's written by a man named Steve Brown. And so if you don't have that book, please get that book and read it with us. And then at the end of August, we'll get together and and discuss the book. It is a wonderful book, Um, especially for those of us who who grew up in um, uh, the religious South. So it is a very good book for us uh, to read. So I hope that you will read that with us. Uh, this month, When Being Good Isn't Good Enough by Steve Brown. Um, Inside your bulletin here, I want to point out some things to you, uh, some things that we'll do today. In a few moments, Eli will come and he will read the remaining verses of Romans chapter 8. So go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39 will be our morning reading this morning. And uh, we're praying for the uh, Methodist Church today. And Brother Daniel there, the pastor. And as you can see, we'll sing songs together. And uh, today we'll conclude our study of the Psalms. Uh, Today we'll look at Psalm 99. Uh, Through the month of July, we've focused on uh, Psalms, specifically the Psalms in the 90s. And so um, today we will conclude with that. Uh, Lord willing, next week we'll begin our fall study. Uh, On Sunday mornings, we're going to go through... The pastorals. <clears throat> the pastoral letters are 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. <clears throat> and so we're going to go through those books. It's been probably 13 or 14 years since we've done that. And so we're going to do that this fall, Lord willing. If you notice inside your bulletin also, there is a, a question for you and for your family. We put this question in there with the verses each week for you to, uh, to discuss with your family. <coughs> And the question is, what good does it do you to believe all of this? And all of this is a reference to the Apostles' Creed, which we've been going through over the past uh, few months. And the answer is, in Christ I am righteous before God and an heir to life everlasting. Amen. So there are the verses represented, and uh, you can read those verses uh, with your family Uh, as you think about the question and the answer. Uh, One other thing I want to mention to you, Miss Margie Hughes uh, passed away. You know, we were praying for her, for her family. She passed away last week. Uh, Her funeral is today, 
excuse me, today at 2 o'clock at um, uh, McKibben and Gwen. So uh, if you want to show your support for her family, you can do that. Uh, visitations from 1 to 2, and then the funeral is at 2 o'clock. Okay? Let's uh, pray together this morning and open our service, and then Eli will come and uh, read Romans 8, verses 31 through 39 for us. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, thank you for this day that you have given us, and we ask that you would remind us that this is your day, it is not our day, and that your providence is perfect, and your intention for us is good. Teach us what is good so that we'll know what is good, and show us the paths of life that we should follow from your holy word. Refresh us today when we think that our work seems useless and when we feel our strength has been used for nothing or to no purpose, we ask that you would cause us to be faithful in the mundane things of life. Help us to sacrifice ourselves to forgive others as we've been forgiven by you in Christ and teach us to use our grief and our sorrow uh, as part of your plan for us. Today we ask that you would open our hearts to, to know your thoughts and to know that your thoughts are not our thoughts or even like our thoughts or your ways are not like our ways. Turn your compassion toward us today because we stand in need of it. We also pray for the Methodist Church today that you would give them eyes to see your invisible hand and your movements in the earth through your providence that you'd work a deep conviction in their hearts as they hear the word of God today. Point them to Jesus today, who is the forgiver of their sins and the one who guides them into wisdom and teaches them the truth. Bless us today with assurance. Uh, bless us with your presence. This is our prayer, and we make it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. As Mr. Kevin said, we'll be in Romans chapter 8. I'll begin in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together as a family to worship and serve you. Uh, I pray that you be with the family of Miss Margie Hughes as of her funeral today. I pray that you give them peace and love. I uh, pray for Mr. Kevin as he brings the message today. I pray that you speak through him and that you speak nothing but the truth through him. Once again, I thank you for forgiving us when we fail you, and I pray that we'll be able to do the same for others when they fail us. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Kevin said again, welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're so glad that each of you are here to worship with us this morning. If y'all would all please stand at this time. We are going to sing some praise songs to the Lord, and we'll begin today by singing, I sing praises, then we'll sing a hymn about the faithfulness of God, and then Kevin's been preaching about the King is coming, the King is coming, and we'll sing hymn 288 one day. I sing praises to your name, O oh Lord, praises to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. 
I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Sing about the glory. I sing glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, and for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. We'll sing hymn 96, Great is Thy Faithfulness, all three stanzas.
indeed sing about the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior when he comes back to, to bring us back to him one day, 288, one day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, one that came back forth to fill his virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on the tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, and one day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. One day this Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Amen. You may be seated. hope you have a Bible with you. If you do, take it and turn with me, please, to Psalm chapter 99. Psalm chapter 99. As you're turning there in your uh, Bible to Psalm chapter 99, there are three words that I want you to think about with me this morning as we uh, work our way through Psalm chapter 99. The first word is the word sovereign, the word sovereign. The second word is the word strength, and the third word is the word salvation. So sovereign, strength, and salvation. Before I read Psalm 99, let's ask the Lord to bless the reading, and then I'll read that psalm this morning. Let's pray. Father, incline our hearts to your testimonies. Open our eyes to see wonderful things here today. Unite our hearts to fear you, to trust you, and to believe what you have said. And today we ask that you would satisfy us with your love as you have vividly demonstrated it in your son Jesus for us. Bless the reading of your word now. Take its benefits and multiply them to us. That's our prayer. And we make it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Psalm chapter 99. This is God's word. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Amen. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word and may he add his benefit to our meditation on it. Today we finish the past few weeks of looking at the Psalms. We began looking at Psalm 95 and moved into 96 and 97 and last week 98. And here today we conclude with 99. As Brad mentioned a moment ago, the theme of all these psalms that we've looked at this month is that the king is coming. And indeed, we're looking forward to the day that the king comes. In fact, the day of the Lord is the anchor for this day that we're currently living. As we turn our attention today, though, to Psalm 99, I want to ask you the question that the people of Psalm 99 were pondering. And the question goes like this. Are you still amazed by God's forgiveness? Are you still amazed by God's forgiveness? Do you remember what it was like the first time that you understood that God forgave you. Do you remember what that was like? Some people describe it as a, a heavy weight lifted off of them. Others are plagued with guilt and shame, and rightfully so, because that's what sin does to us. And the moment that they realized Christ removed sin and its stain and its guilt and its punishment, there was a sense of overwhelm. There was a, a lightness, a light feeling because Christ had dealt with their sin. The more we move past that day, though, the more we encounter life, the more we continue to fail, the more faint and vague that day becomes to us. So today I want us to remember, and by remembering, be amazed that our God forgives sin. And not only that he forgives sin, but that he does that forgiveness of our sin without any of our help. He just does it by his grace in his son, Jesus the Christ. Now, <coughs> the people here in Psalm 99 are really in 2 Chronicles 7. That's the context for Psalm 99. This 
psalm was written to the people who returned from Babylon. If you remember, God punished their sin, years and years and years of sin, by exiling them to Babylon. And they were in Babylon for 70 years. So after that period of punishment, God freed them from the Babylonians who, by the way, were the most cruel people in the world at that time. And so the people of God are freed from the most powerful nation, Babylon. They go back to the land and they begin to rebuild the temple and reconstruct life in the land. And they are overwhelmed with God's forgiveness. Because it appears that God has finally forgiven them after 70 years. Can you imagine living under the burden of guilt and condemnation for 70 years and then all of a sudden God frees you and you go back to the land and you know that He has finally forgiven you? Psalm 99 is an expression of a group of people who are remembering the forgiveness of God and it People who have experienced the forgiveness of God. So there are things that are written here in Psalm 99 that you really won't understand unless you have experienced the forgiveness of God. So maybe I should have started with that question. Have you ever experienced the forgiveness of God? Because it's hard to be amazed by something. If you've never experienced it. There are a few things I want to point out to you here in this passage. The first thing is the word sovereign. The word sovereign. That word is a big word, I know. But it just means that God has the ability. And God has the right to do whatever he chooses. Are you okay with God having that right? This is the part of the sermon where you participate. Are you okay with God being God and you not being God? Are you okay with God being the sovereign? Well, that's what these first three verses show us. That God is God. No one in Israel was God. They were in Babylon for crying out loud. They couldn't overcome Babylon by themselves. They were not sovereign. They didn't have the ability to overthrow Babylon. But there was one who had the ability. And not only did he have the ability, but draw in real close, friends, he had the desire to overthrow Babylon for his people. May I just say to you before we even dive in and look at these verses. God has the ability to forgive your sin. And God has the desire to forgive your sin. And he has proven this. By giving us his very own son. That he who did not spare his own son. But gave him to us. How will he not also graciously give us all things? In verse 1 it says the Lord reigns. That's another way of saying sovereign. There's only one who reigns. It's not you. It's not me. It's not any other human for crying out loud. It's God and God only. And he reigns. He is like a king who is ruling from his throne. He has all the power to do whatever he wants to do. He has all of the control. <coughs> if we're being honest, that's what we want, isn't it? Control? Don't you want to control your life? He said, no, no, I trust the Lord, you dirty, rotten hypocrite. Let me prove to you that you want to control your life. Do you worry? Are you ever anxious? Do you get nervous? Are you ever discouraged? Do you get into times of distress and despair? That's the symptoms. But the cause is that you want to control your life. 
And when you look at life, you realize I can't control it. So the only response you have are the emotions I just gave you. Worry, doubt, fear, distress, anxiety. When this verse says that the Lord reigns here, you and I as believers of the gospel should take great joy in the fact that He reigns, which relieves us of our duty to reign. Can I get a witness? I don't have to be in control. I don't have to be in charge. I don't have to feel anxiety anymore. I don't have to worry. I don't have to doubt. I don't have to do those things because He is sovereign, not me. This is His world, not mine. This is His day, not mine. It's not personal. God's Providence is perfect and God's intention is good. And that providence gave us Jesus and that good intention crucified Him and raised Him from the dead. So now I'm just one of His children. So the context here is that God had just defeated the Babylonians. Now, I know that means virtually nothing to you, right? It's okay. You don't have to be super spiritual to say, that's right, preacher, to that. The Babylonians mean virtually nothing to you. So I want them to now mean something to you. Are you okay with that? The Babylonians were the world power at this time. There was no contest. There was no nation that could go up against them. In fact, multiple nations on multiple occasions got together to try to overthrow Babylon and Babylon overthrew multiple nations at one time. They were cruel and vindictive and powerful. A lot like America. And God, in a moment, in an instant, raised up Cyrus, a Persian, which were a very benevolent, kind-hearted group of people. They were probably southern like us. And in a moment, overthrew Babylon. God used Cyrus and the Persians to do this. And by doing it, he frees his people. So in that context, his people are going back after routing the world power at that time. What else could they say other than our God reigns? Right? Yeah. Let the nations tremble, he says, because all the nations have seen what has happened to Babylon. He sits between the cherubim. Now, we probably don't understand that. We probably just pass right over it. He sits between the cherubim. But this is an image which comes from the Old Testament. Now, let me paint a picture for you in two ways. Number one, when God exiled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, He put cherubim at the entrance of Eden to keep people out of Eden. So those cherubim protect God's presence. But there's a second illustration I think is more fitting, especially in the context of 2 Chronicles 7 and Psalm 99, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. You remember the Ark of the Covenant? Inside this Ark, there was the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and other paraphernalia from Israel's history. On top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was this thing called the mercy seat. And one time a year, the high priest would go behind the veil, only one time, and he would put blood on the mercy seat. So when God looks down at the covenant, which is the Ten Commandments, in the Ark, he sees that his people have broken the law. But when the blood is on the mercy seat, God looks down and He sees blood. He doesn't see broken law. Y'all all right? Well, on the sides of that mercy seat are two angels. They're called cherubim. 
And they're focused at the mercy seat. They are looking at the mercy seat because that's where God dwells. Beloved, you and I have broken God's law numerous times. We are lawbreakers. We have coveted. We have lied. We have stolen. We have lusted in our hearts. We have murdered. We have gossiped. We have been anxious and worried and all the other sins that I could sit up here and give you the list of. We have broken and over and over and over and sinned against God. But when God looks upon us, He looks at the mercy seat and sees Christ's death in our place. So He doesn't see the broken law. He sees Christ's sacrificial blood for us. And these angels are longing to look into that atonement because in the atonement is where God dwells. If you ever want to know where God is, He's in the atonement. Last week we looked at Psalm 98. And many of you, many of you texted me and called me and said, that was for me. Because that psalm was about feeling left by God. Abandoned by God. So again this week I'll ask you, have you ever felt abandoned by God? Have you ever felt as though He doesn't care? He's not concerned for you. He's aloof. He's silent. Have you ever felt that way by God? And the answer is yes. If you've got a pulse and you believe. It's a normal occurrence. So where do we go then when we feel abandoned? Where do we go from Psalm 98 and that feeling of disillusionment? And abandonment. Where do we go? Well, this week in Psalm 99, he tells us we go where God is. Well, where is God? The atonement. We go to Christ. We may not feel Him while we're driving down the road, but the reason we don't feel Him is because we didn't go to Him. If we draw near to Him, He draws near to us, and we must draw near to Him the way He has prescribed, namely, in His Son, Jesus the Christ. Notice it says, where does He dwell? He dwells in the atonement. He dwells in forgiveness. Do you remember my question to you a moment ago? Are you still amazed at His forgiveness of you? Now, I know some of you. I, I know you. I know you. You know me and I know you. So we'll just keep that together, alright? But I know some of you are thinking right now, I wish somebody else was here hearing this sermon. Right? Some of you are thinking, I wish so and so was hearing this. But so-and-so's not here. You are. It's meant for you today by God's providence. You are in this place to hear the question, are you amazed by God's forgiveness? Not your mom, not your dad, not your cousin, not, not anybody else. Are you amazed? In God's wonderful grace, He's brought you here today to contemplate that question. Are you amazed at His forgiveness? Do you revel in His forgiveness? Do you go to the atonement? Do you find Christ there? He says, let the earth shake. Because one day, the one who made the atonement will come again. The King is coming. And so this is what it is when He says sovereign. Here's the second word. The word strength. <coughs> if you look in verse 4... All of us, of course, read English. Some of us better than others, I guess. But the Old Testament was not written in English. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Now, if I wanted to emphasize something to you today, I would text you in big capital letters. Right? Have you ever gotten an email from somebody that's all capital letters and you think, why are you yelling at me? Right? And then you realize, well, it was your mother and she just hit the caps lock and didn't know it and didn't care either. So she just hit send and it came to you. She really wasn't yelling. Right? If I also wanted to emphasize something to you, I could put this thing on the end of a sentence. Do you know what it is? An exclamation point. The Hebrews didn't emphasize things that way. Here's how Hebrews would emphasize things. Whatever they wanted to emphasize, they put that word first in the sentence. 
So if I wanted to say Jesus Christ saves sinners, and I wanted to emphasize sinners, I'd say sinners Jesus Christ saves. Whatever you put first is what's emphasized. Well, here in the English, you can't see it. So I'm going to tell you, the word that's emphasized by the writer of this psalm is the word strength. It's the word might in some of your translations. The king in his might <coughs> loves justice. It really says strength. The king loves justice. Strength to do what? Well, remember the context. He's just delivered this people after 70 years of captivity from some of the most cruel and most powerful people in the world. And he has brought his people back to the land that he gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he has established order in that place. Wouldn't you agree it takes a great deal of strength to save? And wouldn't you agree it takes a great deal of strength to order? If you think back to the creation of the world, God is sovereign. In the beginning, God did something. What did He do? He created. He created out of His own strength. But He created order. Now, you and I are unfamiliar with His order because you and I were born after the fall. You and I have never known the world as it was intended to be. We've only known a disordered, chaotic world. Can I get a witness? That's the world in which we live. It's chaotic. It's not natural. This is not the way the world should be. Now, we've done a good job, I think, of trying to cope with it and make it through this world, but the way that you've experienced the world thus far was not God's good intention for the world. And I know you don't have a category for that because you don't know anything other than the way we've lived thus far. But when God created the world by His strength and by the word of His power, He created order. That means everything had its purpose, everything had its definition, and everything functioned properly. And then what He created on the sixth day, mankind messed it all up. And we've been doing that since then. <clears throat> but when he says here, strength, he's referring to order. He brought these tribes back to rebuild the tabernacle so that in that tabernacle temple structure, he could dwell among them again and have order. Notice verse 4. He says the word equity. Strength, the Lord caused equity. The word equity means order, by the way. Verse 5, exalt Him, our Lord, worship at His footstool. See, this post-exilic people were called upon to worship God at the new temple. They were constructing this new temple and they were supposed to worship Him there. Beloved, may I gently and tenderly say to you today that the same command to these people is true of you and me. We must also worship God at the new temple. And for those of you who are a little behind, I'm not talking about a building. In John chapter 2, Jesus goes into the temple. And Jesus overturns the money changing tables. And He drives them out. And they said, by what authority are you doing this? And He said, if you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it in Three days. The significance of the temple in 2 Chronicles 7 and the significance of the temple in Psalm 99 is the same significance of the temple in John 2. That's where you meet God. It's where man and God coexist. Now Jesus says in John 2, you destroy this temple which took 46 years to rebuild and I will rebuild it in three days. Here's Jesus' point. I am the temple. I'm where you meet God. I'm the one through whom God rules the world. 
I'm the king who has come and I'm the king who's going to come. And I'm the one in whom man and God coexist eternally. So now, look at verse 5. Exalt the Lord and worship at His footstool. Where should you and I worship? At the feet of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul made it clear. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Here's number three. (coughs) Salvation. If you notice in verses 6 through 9, he mentions Moses and Aaron and Samuel and they did this and the pillar of cloud, etc. As we think about this salvation here for this group of people, I want you to know that it's not any different for you and me today. God doesn't have a plan A and a plan B. God just has a plan and He's executing it. And the plan was, and the plan is, and the plan will be, God will always have a mediator who intercedes for His people. There will always be someone to intercede for His people. And that one, so that we don't make any mistakes, is Jesus the Christ. But in the Old Testament, Jesus had not yet come. So notice what the psalmist says. He says in verse 6, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called on the Lord (coughs) and he answered them. If you remember in Exodus 32-34, the people were worshiping an idol a golden calf. Moses comes down off the mountain and he's furious. And God is too. And Moses interceded for the people and destruction was diverted. Do you remember? Notice the next name, Aaron. At Korah, there was a grand rebellion. They're in the wilderness walking through at this place called Korah. There's a rebellion against God's leadership. Moses, Aaron... The actual earth opens up and swallows those who were rebelling against Him. But in that moment, God does not wipe out the entire generation of people. And He does that based upon Aaron's intercession for them. If you fast forward to Samuel, if you notice in that same verse, Samuel The children of Israel were battling with the Philistines. The Philistines were mighty, mighty people. If you remember, one of their giants named Goliath. It was a powerful army at that time. They were defeating the Israelite people. And Samuel interceded for the people of God. And the people of God won the victory. And they defeated the enemy. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know today you have one who is greater than Moses, greater than Aaron, and greater than Samuel who is praying for you, interceding for you now. There are people in the world, God help them, who believe that you can get saved and then lose it. Which totally denigrates The continued work of Christ at the right hand of the Father. This is utter blasphemy. To say that God would save you and then let you go. That means you do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Ascended to the right hand of the Father. And is ever living to make intercession for you from there. Brothers and sisters, He lived for us. He died for us. He rose for us. But never, ever, ever forget He's praying for you now and keeping you saved. You can't lose what you didn't get. And God got you and He doesn't lose what He got. These three prominent leaders here intercede, which points to Christ. They called on the Lord and He answered them. He spoke and they kept. They obeyed after they heard Him. You see, God helps those who turn to Him. 
Let me say that a different way. God does not help those who help themselves. See, all this time you thought that was Bible, didn't you? God helps those who help themselves. No. Not anywhere in there. God doesn't need you to help Him. God helps those who turn to Him. Helpless, weak, ungodly, sinful, enemies, all the rest that describes us. We turn to Him. He is compassionate. He is forgiving. Notice the next verse. He is a forgiving God. Look at it. Look at it. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who turn to Him. Verse 8. You are a forgiving God. He is not aloof. He is not unconcerned with you. Some of you probably needed to hear that again this week. He's not aloof. He has not left you. He has not abandoned you. It feels that way, I know. But fight through the feeling and get the fact in your mind and heart. He's not left you. He's not abandoned you. He is the forgiving God. And if you want to know where He is, He hasn't moved. He hasn't changed addresses. He is in His Son, Jesus. And Jesus forgives. Exalt the Lord, He says yet again. From verse 5 now to verse 9. Exalt the Lord. Worship at His holy mountain. Worship... <coughs> At the new temple. And friends, that new temple is Christ. Are you still amazed by God's forgiveness? Are you still amazed that this sovereign God with all this strength came to your aid and saved you? That He forgave you. Well, if so, I want to ask you three questions for our applications. First one is this. Are you a forgiving person? <clears throat> Preacher, why didn't you just dismiss us right there? Why didn't you just let us go? That was good. Preacher, we would have given you an attaboy and we gone home. But now you're meddling, preacher. You're meddling. And indeed, I am meddling. <clears throat> if God is a forgiving God, and you are amazed at His forgiveness for you, are you a forgiving person? Because we give forgiveness... The way we've experienced it. And if we haven't experienced forgiveness very deeply. We will not extend forgiveness very deeply. Are you a forgiving person? Here's the second question. <clears throat> Do you pray for non-believers? Do you pray for non-believers? Moses, Aaron, Samuel, they interceded for <clears throat> people who acted as though they didn't believe. And if we're being honest, there are times when you and I are not believing, when we're doubting, when we're dismissing, and yet at the same time, Christ is praying for us and interceding for us. Do you pray for non-Christians? <clears throat> Do you ask God to save non-Christians? Are you concerned at all for other people being forgiven? And here's the last question. Do you have the forgiveness of God? Do you have the forgiveness of God? Now, at this point, I'm not asking, do you have church tradition? <coughs> Were you raised in church? I'm not asking if you've even had a church experience. Maybe you were in a Baptist church and you walked down an aisle like this. That's wonderful. 
Maybe you were at a church camp or you were at a vacation Bible school or something. That's wonderful. All those things are fine. I'm not asking you if you had any of those types of experiences. What I'm asking you is quite different. I'm asking you if you've ever experienced the forgiveness of God in Christ. Has there been a time in your life when you realized your sin killed Jesus? Not generally speaking, Jesus lived, Jesus died. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. No, no, no. Has it dawned on you that your sin killed him? Has it dawned on you that he lived a perfectly obedient life because you couldn't and haven't? Has it dawned on you that God raised him from the dead to shout at you? To scream at you? To confirm to you that he loves you? Has the forgiveness of God become personal to you? Do you have the forgiveness of God? If not, that forgiveness is found in a specific place. And that place has a name and it's Jesus. You go to Jesus and confess your sin and He is faithful to forgive your sin. And in Jesus, you will experience the forgiveness of God. May God bless the preaching of His Word. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, take and seal what we've heard into our hearts. Produce the fruit of repentance. Produce the fruit of faith within us so that we would believe Christ for us. His life and righteousness his death, and the erasing of our sin. Help us to believe. Bless these dear ones today with your spirit and power. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.